Thank you so much to Oliver for bringing us the chilling reality of Ice Watch, and of course for so brilliantly bringing the voice of the artist into this existential conversation. Now, in our next session, I'm delighted to be building on the dialogue about sustainability and profitability. Our two set, uh, speakers have extensive expertise in the apparel industry, which is a $2.5 trillion business, which, as you know, is responsible for 10% of global greenhouse emissions. Now, this morning, our guests will be furthering the business case for doing good and doing well. Stephen Brennickmeyer comes from five generations committed to corporate citizenship as founders of CNA. He has long advanced the fight for eco-awareness while feeding consumer demand, and in his role at Willow Investments, he's focused on the social impact of doing good and doing well. Kara Smith has also proven the business case for fashion sustainability time and time again. In her leadership roles at Jill Sander, at Burberry Prossum, she has been a disruptor of the most constructive kind. She's currently the VP of Glasgow Caledonian College, which is surprisingly not in Scotland, but in the heart of New York City. And she's also the founder of Fair Fashion Centre with a mission for the common good. Please welcome our speakers to the stage. Stephen, we heard so much from Stella, from Christian, about the impact of the $2 t-shirt. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear from you how much fault really there is at fast fashion and what you are doing in your work to alleviate the pressure while still meeting the insatiable consumer demand. Mm. Kara? Uh, so I think there's uh, a bit of a conflict about fast fashion in the sense that it is actually creating uh, a more fluid um, use of fashion. We kind of burn through and throw away things in a way that we haven't in the past. That's creating a tremendous trash problem. Uh, it's about a $3.6 billion textile waste issue in America, $100 million in New York City alone. So it is there. I think it's important to know that is actually not only the company's fault, but the consumer's fault. So people are buying it. There's a market for it. It services customers that maybe can't buy at higher prices. Uh, and our very conscious young people live their life in photographs. So the idea of I don't want to always appear on Instagram in the same thing, I think is there. Uh, what can be done about it, I think, are two things primarily. Uh, the Fair Fashion Center works with 41 CEOs. They represent about 12% of the global business on collective impact. Uh, if you listen to what Stella was talking about, there's an important way to come at fashion and sustainability from the design <coughs> side. How do you actually build better product? Are we conscious of everything that goes into it, from preferred fibers to can the buttons be recycled ocean plastic and so on? So design side, very important. But the other side is operating efficiencies. Uh, I know Curtis Ravenel, I think, from Bloomberg is in the room. And early on, he taught me, chase the waste. If you start to look at what are the excessive inputs that are creating environmental impact and think, how much water are we using? How much chemicals are we using? How much packaging are we using? And the more you look at those operating efficiencies, you hit profitability and sustainability, and that allows companies to think more of sustainability as not a bucket of problems, but actually as a bucket of opportunities. And that's a great point in terms of the opportunities that you've been finding in your work in terms of chasing that waste. Uh, I'd love to hear from you in terms of your thoughts on moving from that linear fashion model to one which is much more circular and demanded in the world today. Yes, we work uh, very intensively uh, also through the CNA Foundation in the field of circular, the circular economy. And uh, I think what you said earlier, obviously, there's a massive demand for fast fashion. And uh, I think the problem is if there is a demand from customers, you have to adhere to this demand. But OK, we, from our side, have to make sure that those products are produced more sustainably so that actually uh, that issue is going to be solved better. So we work very closely uh, with the industry in our supply chain with suppliers, etc., and uh, we have this center in Amsterdam called Fashion for Good, which is sort of an inclusive center for all the retailers and suppliers around the world. Um, um, Stella McCartney is also part of this, this uh, initiative, and uh, we are working helping young entrepreneurs to develop new techniques in order to create more sustainable and, and creative fashion. And uh, so I think that it's very, very important that we, through that side, try to really make a difference in that field. Uh, so we work mainly in the CNA Foundation on uh, 
on sustainable cotton. Cotton is obviously one of the areas which is uh, like farming. It's farming, really, and uh, how can you produce cotton which is more sustainable? And 95% uh, of the cotton that is being sold at CNA currently is, is organic cotton, which is more expensive than sort of the traditional cotton, but we know that obviously it's better for the environment, it's also better for the consumer, and uh, obviously we sell it for the same price as the other cotton uh, around the world, and uh, so we subsidize it, so we take a lower margin here. Uh, that's fascinating, of course, looking at it from uh, the imprint of CNA, which has such a tremendous impact. And in a dialogue with Stella, she was mentioning yesterday, of course, that apparel is the second biggest polluter uh, of fresh water globally. And when mixed in with agriculture, as Lisbeth was mentioning, potentially the first. I guess a question from a younger designer in uh, the room last night was, is this uh, only the domain of the largest players? How can uh, the smaller manufacturers, the smaller players, really take advantage uh, of some of these advances? And how can they really scale and send the elevator back down? I don't know who'd like to address that. Uh, you know, what I think is interesting is all of the innovative new materials that are coming up uh, may not be at scale, actually. So for a lot of the smaller players that are building their businesses now, you know, you take a lot of the big companies that are 25, maybe $50 billion in business, that's like trying to turn a cruise ship around and make that responsible and sustainable, much more difficult. The younger designers actually have great flexibility to look at biofabrics, a lot of the things that Stella is talking about, and build a business according to the rules that we now know are the way that business should be done. What are you seeing in terms of supply chains, how you're driving that impact, and of course how that is filtering through across the sector? I think the supply chain, obviously, it is last minute delivery, which is obviously always a key issue in these things, and so that you actually fly product to the markets where you sell it and I think that is an area where you really have to look at does it really make sense because obviously the costs and also the the environmental footprint of that that supply chain uh, what I'm very interested in is, is shipping as an example uh, because uh, currently also the shipping fleets around the world use the worst diesel available because it's the cheapest and so they're high polluters and I think the industry should come out and say by 2030 we want to have all our ships that produce that, that transport our product and zero emissions so use for instance hydrogen power etc and these type of things but I think the industry has to really make a point there to make sure that obviously that part of the supply chain is really looked at as well. How do we apply that as well in terms of what we're seeing with the white bands driving around town? The rise of online seems to suggest some heightened efficiency, which as we know is actually exacerbating CO2 emissions. What are you seeing in any other industries that you think might be impactful here as well? Yeah, I think online has obviously a very important role to play in the, in the industry as such, but okay, we haven't yet understood what is the carbon footprint of online that you actually get even on Sundays to delivery at home with a little white van which obviously use, is, is powered by diesel and obviously there's a lot of talk about uh, drone delivery but okay that probably takes some time to do that so I think uh, the online business is, an, is a tricky business and uh, I hope that people like Amazon are looking at that as well and um, so for us, uh, obviously online also, the retailer as such has to reinvent their business model to actually counter what, what online does so well. And obviously that is another, another big issue that we are facing at this moment. Something I just want to say on the manufacturing side that you were asking, uh, something that we're working on uh, with our group is actually a blended financing mechanism to retrofit fashions, factories, and mills with renewable energy, directing a slice of the savings created through those power purchase agreements to livelihoods programs. And I think this kind of large-scale thinking that involves the science, the nonprofit community, uh, finance community, and fashion, if everybody takes a little hop into the center and works together, that's the greatest place to scale immediate solutions, which is of critical importance now. I think that gives such excitement to this forum in terms of bringing the different disciplines together. And where we sit with Michael Bloomberg as our chairman at the Serpentine Galleries, that idea, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it, is very much at the fore of every board meeting. What are you seeing in terms of data and transparency uh, and the importance uh, of bringing the visibility to these practices across the supply chain and down to the consumer, who I was told to refer to as the citizen, oh. uh, as the new <laughs> forward-thinking term? 
Um, so I think, uh, and I'm not saying it because I'm in the building, but Mike Bloomberg and actually the Bloomberg terminals are directly at the heart of climate change, uh, both environmentally on that side, of course, but also on the sustainability side, on the social side. And that's because on the Bloomberg terminals, all the investors can see when I'm looking at it from the fashion point of view, what are your environmental, social, and governance practices? All of the data that's being scraped shows tweets, it shows articles, it shows who are your biggest suppliers. So the more the investment community is there saying, wow, a third of your cotton is being grown in a water-stressed area. Wow, you are producing in an area of geopolitical risk. That's a material risk, and that interests the investors. And as such, I think it creates kind of a domino effect down the supply chain, because the investors are asking the companies. The companies are then obliged to collaborate more and more with the supply chain to say they are looking as investors for progress and not perfection. And I think certainly I see our uh, CEOs are certainly really looking at TCFD, which is uh, the Task Force for Financial Related Disclosure as a guideline. They are now using SASB, which is the Sustainability Accounting Standards, to really look at if investors want decision useful information on chemicals, on raw materials, on livelihoods, on what is our environmental impact with the trash, how are we gonna actually improve those things? So the pressure from the environmental side and the visibility that the Bloomberg Terminals creates, I would say is probably the greatest driver of change. You know, I heard this morning money makes the world go around, and that is certainly the case. We like to say culture attracts capital faster than capital attracts culture, <laughs> but somewhere in there there's a symbiosis as well. Uh, do you have something to add to that in terms of what you might be also seeing in, in no. other industries in your investments that's relevant? I find interesting in, in the discussions uh, going back to 10, 15 years, uh, for us, one of the key issues was child labor, forced labor, uh, looking at improving the working conditions of, of uh, people involved in our factories. And I think those issues are still there because obviously uh, people still use subcontractors. And for us, the big challenge now is also, as we said before, is to figure out how we can be more sustainable in the produ production cycle so that we actually know the factories that we work with that they actually are sustainable, the way that they, on the one hand, use labor, that they have got the, the, the proper conditions and we're checking it on it uh, very frequently, but also that uh, the environmental footprint of the production is, is sound. So the, how do they uh, recycle water, etc. So I think there's a definitely shift from let's say the working conditions forced labor, uh, let's say aspect, which are not yet solved, but which are being solved in the future. And, uh, but they're now very much more to the climate and sustainability. Topic. And would you say a lot of that, of course, um, the Rana Plaza disaster uh, was a moment uh, which spurred so much debate and discussion and action, I would think. Um, and in my time as chair of the British Fashion Council out in Asia, there was a lot of dialogue with Livia yeah. Firth. So at the time, her film, The True Cost, was very interesting in that dialogue. So it's great to see that the conversation has moved on and that the standards uh, have moved up since then. Yeah. I think you know that kind of created a clear slice and sort of the shot heard around the fashion world when it was only six years ago, how much money has been spent to have better practices and so on. Suddenly we realized there was a collision of priorities. There is the data transparency which makes it possible to see, de see deep into the supply chain. We can all Google other people's living conditions which helps values to rule the day. But consumers are asking, finance is asking, we all have kind of the Amazon effect in the fashion business because they sat down on the business and are creating therefore sort of a question of what does business look like for the future. So this collision of priorities post Rana Plaza, I think is forcing a redesign of the fashion industry from the inside out actually. I thought that idea of reformation was so interesting as well. I'm sure you noticed that Chris Wiley, uh, the ex-head of Cambridge Analytica, has now gone over to H&M uh, to harness the power of AI to minimize waste. Um, so I'd love to also just finally ask you about that idea of that chase for waste. Um, what are you seeing that's really inspiring? As the CEO, I say CEO often stands for Chief Eternal Optimist. So what is that message of optimism that you can bring us um, in terms of either company names you want to throw out there or chemicals or technologies? What is giving you the great hope of today? for the future of tomorrow? Uh, I would say the great hope for me is what I would kind of call the in-between space. I think there's a new space emerging, this kind of everybody hopping in, where there is this collaboration on dialogue and the realization we're kind of all in it together. Sustainability is totally imperfect. There is no, 
I like to say kind of the sheet is always too short for that bed. Oh yes, we're using cotton that uses more water. Oh no, we're gonna use polyester, no good, it's because it's an oil base. Like no matter which way you go with it, it's imperfect. So I think we all kind of need to say that and say, what are the best solutions that we can have? And that's really going to take a marriage between industry and financing, nonprofit and science, as I said, to really identify those scalable solutions. And that gives me great hope in the hurry that we have. Are you similarly optimistic? I think what we do with Fashion for Good, the center in Amsterdam, we run these accelerator programs with a Californian company called Plug and Play. And there's so much creativity out there. And uh, what we do, we have, I think, about 60 companies, young companies who are actually working with us uh, in the accelerator programs. And uh, we try then through our work and connecting them to our network that we have to actually scale them up to come with these new solutions and really support the solutions. So I think there is a lot there. The other thing that I think is important is obviously uh, we have to bring production closer to where the customers are. Because at this moment, most of the production is in, out in Southeast Asia. And obviously, you've got all the logistics to get it where it needs to be. What is the future? What do the robots mean for that? What does automation mean in terms of that supply chain and how that yeah, will drive? Probably you centers? can bring uh, production back closer to where the consumer is. And uh, I think uh, there are definitely opportunities in that space. So I'm very optimistic there. Something, uh, there's something about predictive analytics, which should one day allow us to make less product, uh, I hope, as we go forward. But just uh, building on the creativity thought, I want to just give a shout out, since we're also here with Vanity Fair, because I did with Bloomberg. <laughs> Fashion, uh, Hollywood, and the media actually reflect and can drive cultural change. So I think the collaboration with media on driving sustainability to say, it's about wellness, it's about responsible choices, it's something that feels good, it's not a bucket of unse unsexy, difficult problems, but it actually should be the new normal is something which is super important. So I think the more that the media helps us rebrand that and push that out to consumers with kind of, uh, I guess I would call that positive propaganda, I think would be really helpful and Vanity Fair is one of the ones that has a great power to be able to do that actually. Fantastic. On that positive message, thank you for that very fast forum on fast fashion. It's very impressive to see the thank changes you. that thank you're you. catalyzing thank today for a better future for thank tomorrow. You. Thank, thank you for you, having Kara. us. Thank, thank you, Stephen.